that someday if we shall pass beyond this veil of mortal sin and have to go into that dark place called death, when he comes and he calls, we'll come out from among those that are dead, for we know him in the power of his resurrection. We're so happy for that. And we're so interested, Lord, in others knowing that way. That's why we have assembled tonight, that others might know it. this perfect peace, this peace that passes understanding, that gives us that great hope. Now you've seen the hands that went up, Lord, and thou art God that knows the secret of every heart, knows the request. And we are asking thee, our Father, that you will remember each one of those and may their request be granted, Lord. Lord, heal the sick, make the blind to see and the deaf to hear, the lame to walk, and may there not be a feeble person on this when this service closed tonight. May every cot be empty, every wheelchair empty. Every man or woman's got a bad heart, skipping beat, may it be perfectly beating normal. All sickness vanished, all sin gone, and may we go for you tonight. Going on our way like those who came from Emmaus in days gone by, the first witness of his resurrection, saying the same words, did our heart burn within us as he talked to us along the way. For we ask it in the name of him who has redeemed us, Thy Son, the Lord Jesus. Amen. <coughs> Just a little bit hoarse. I was preaching this morning at one of the churches here, Brother Fuller's, and we had a great time down there this morning <coughs> in the Lord. And I just get blessed, and I just don't know when to stop. And we're thankful for the old-fashioned gospel that never lost its power and shall never lose its power. Now tonight we have given out again for a healing service tonight, our prayer for the sick. We never want to get that mixed. We can pray for the sick, but a healing service takes God to do it. Now remember, healing is something that's in the past. Salvation is something that's in the past. First thing to make you recognize that is God's Holy Spirit. God has to reveal it to you. It will never be real until God reveals it to you. No man can come to me except my Father draws him first. All that the Father has given me will come to me. There you are. So what a privilege it is when any sinner ever feels that little tug at their heart. What a privilege of God giving a call to the greatest thing that could happen to you. Having eternal life. Now... Tomorrow night is uh, an off night for us. We're going to fight uh, in this ring here, a different kind of a fight. We're fighting the enemy, Satan. But uh, men are going to wrestle or box or something here tomorrow night, and it gives us a chance to get just a night's rest. And then we go through the rest of next week, on until next Sunday night, the Lord willing. Then we hurry off from here to, to Oklahoma. To start in Tulsa, about, have about four days of rest, I think, and then start in Tulsa. And then, if the Lord willing, from there we may go, planning where if we leave here, we're on our way overseas, the Lord willing, for a complete European trip. And so we desire your prayer. Your fine cooperation in these meetings has been wonderful. Tuesday morning, I couldn't take this man's place, but I'm going to try to. Brother David Duplessis, my associate and bosom friend, one of the outstanding teachers of this day. And uh, God is giving him a ministry that's unique, bringing the churches together in a fellowship. That doesn't mean just only for gospel, that's all of the churches, all believers. 
Methodist, Presbyterian, Baptist, and many times when we may I have often been accused of, of uh, saying things against churches. And remember, if I do that, I don't mean it in that way. I'm, I'm meaning I'm hitting at the sin that's been permitted to operate in the church. I don't mean the church. No denomination. I love them, everyone, because in every denomination, God has children. See? They're in all denominations. That's Brother David, a great vision, and he's been blessed of the Lord to speak at Harvard and many of the great universities here in the state in different places, and God has given him favor among all different churches. He's been speaking over at Levin's and Garfield of a morning. He's to fly now to Indianapolis, Indiana, to be with the Methodist people there. Then coming back Tuesday sometime, and he, I'm to take his place, or try to, a Tuesday morning to speak to the minister, which I love to do that, and have fellowship with the ministers and their wives and so forth on Tuesday morning. I think that service will begin at the 1030 with our precious brother here who have just learned to love more every day, our brother Shores. And so we are to be there Tuesday morning. And our brother Borders, I guess, will remain here with us and Leo and Jean and the rest of the staff. And Brother David will be back for Wednesday morning to take his post again. Now, I am trusting that the Lord will give us a settled faith tonight. I trust that this will be the night that that great thing that we have looked forward for, I have myself for the last two or three years, to break right in on this meeting here tonight in Phoenix. Oh, may God in his mercy look down upon us. I would like to say it started at Phoenix. One night this next week, the Lord willing, I will give you what I know about it, if the Lord willing, of something I believe is, I've never, well, we'll just wait. Now, we wish to read some of the scripture here tonight because I do not think that any service is complete without reading the scripture. Seeing this group of people here tonight before we do it, I know that someone has dismissed their churches for this service. The Lord bless you, my brethren, and your fine cooperation. God be with you. And now we wish to read tonight out of the book of St. Matthew's Gospel. And I want to read maybe a few verses in here. And let us begin reading at the, let us read the 8th verse of the 19th chapter. And he said unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, suffered you to put away your wives. But from the beginning it wasn't so. Now, we are not going to speak on marriage and divorce. <coughs> But I'm going to take those last few words in there for a text. It wasn't so from the beginning. When Jesus came to the earth to tabernacle with mankind, and as the first 30 years of his life was, we had not much record of it, but when he began to go out among the people, he found very strange things going on. And he found the teachers of that day teaching things that wasn't just exactly right. And I wonder if he come today if we would be kind of a little bit on the same way. I'm taking all of us together, the whole universal church, that if we wouldn't, he wouldn't say like he did in that day, it wasn't so from the beginning. Now, if you notice, he referred back to the beginning. And therefore, if we want to know what truth, what right things are, we'll have to go back to the beginning. Now, God is infinite. We all know that, that he cannot change. That's where our faith can rest so assured 
If God says anything, it has to be that way forever. It can never be changed. Now, God is omnipotent, omnipresent. By being omniscient, makes him omnipresent. He, he knows all things, but God cannot be just like the air is. Because God has a dwelling place. God is not a myth. God is a being. God. Jesus. He. God. Pronoun. He is a being. Therefore, he is omnipresent, omnipresent, omnipotent, and infinite. Now, to be infinite is, comes from the word infinite, which there is no limit. He is eternal. Eternal is like a rain. It goes around and around. And you're trying to find where it began or where it ends. There is no beginning or ending to it. God is like a great diamond that uh, sets like this and the gift of the Spirit is the reflection of this diamond that reflects rays of light off of this big diamond. Like nine spiritual gifts in the church is like nine rays that the Holy Spirit is reflecting into the church. What a light to walk in. From the one great diamond, God. God being infinite, he knew all things. Before the world was ever created, he knows every fly, every gnat, every kind of every daddy's eye, how much power he had before the world ever started. That's infinite. He knows the end from the beginning. So that makes him infinite. He knows. So then he's omnipresent by knowing all things, what's going on. Now, whatever he says, it is forever the truth. If God is ever called on the scene to make a decision, and he makes that decision, it has to be forever the same way. He cannot change that decision. Because if he says, well, I, I thought that then, but I know better now. Well, if that be the case, then he is not God. Now, I can say, this year I believe a certain thing, and tomorrow I can come back and say, no, I was wrong, because I'm finite. You are the same, but not God. His decision is always perfect. Now, if God made a statement and, and gave a way of escape for a sinner and based it upon faith to believe, the next sinner comes to God, God got to recognize him just like he did the first one. And if God based divine healing upon faith in the shed blood of the Lord Jesus, and the first man came received healing, like the man at the gate called beautiful, through the faith in the name of Jesus, the next man on the same basis will receive the same thing. If God poured out the Holy Ghost on the people at Pentecost, and that was his decision, that how that the church must operate under the power of the Holy Spirit, he cannot change that. He cannot turn it over and say, well, I'll give it to Bishop. I can give it to this, or I'll give it to that. He's got to still remain with that same decision. And if the church on the day of Pentecost received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and the, the reaction that came from that baptism of the Holy Ghost will be the reaction on every person that ever receives the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Medicine. Medicine, if it's given like a certain, not a salt vaccine or whatever it might be, if it goes to work and operates on a certain person, Make them act a certain way, the next person that it takes the hold of will have to act the same way for his inoculation. That's the way it is with the Holy Spirit, with God. His words are perfect. He is infinite. Now, when God says it must be this way, now on the day of Pentecost, Peter was speaking, and the people were then speaking with tongues and making a noise and and speaking in other languages, acting like they were drunk men. And they 
was questioning about these things and wanted to know how they could be saved. And Peter told them to repent and be baptized. Every one of them in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of his sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is not to you and to your children and to them as far off. Even as many as the Lord our God shall call, the promise is for whosoever will, let him come. So you see, God cannot change that. If that is the word of God, it's perfect forever. Now, we find out that as the ages go on, man come in and pervert that word of God to make it fit a certain tradition. Now they'll come around and say, there's no more need of receiving the Holy Ghost. It's just to come in of fellowship. Now if it would have been fellowship, the Holy Spirit would have not had to come. Now, some of them said we keep the commandments. That's all we have to do. If keeping the commandments is all that God requires, Jesus died in vain. The Holy Spirit didn't have to come because they had the commandments before the Holy Spirit came. But it takes the Holy Spirit to keep the commandments. You have to have it. God's Word is always perfect and always the same each time. Now man perverts it and changes it. And when Jesus comes the first time, he saw a man that was doing this very same thing, perverting the ways of God. And Jesus said to him, In vain you worship me. In vain you worship me, teaching for doctrine the commandments of man. Now anything that's in vain has oh, nothing to it. It's no good. If I walk down the street to pick up a dollar bill and there's no dollar bill there, then I walk down there in vain. It's in vain. And Jesus told those worshippers of that day that they were worshipping him in vain, teaching for doctrine the commandments of man. What am I trying to say? You've got to go back to the word of God to get back. You've got to go back. The church will never be able to move forward any further until it gets to the word and moves on the word. We've got to come to the Word. No matter what the sensation is, what it looks like, how big the church is, how mighty the people are, you've got to come back to the Word of God. That's God's eternal Word, and we have to come to it. Jesus said in that day, any time he found people looking to the church for salvation. Now, so many people do that today. They say, well, I belong to the church. I belong to this church. And they're looking to it for salvation. What did they find? What did Jesus find them worshiping? Not the word of God, but tradition, creed. And if he'd come today, he'd find a lot of us in the same vein, taking creed. Now, if Jesus had come today and you'd say, Oh, Lord, my church, the first thing that we do, we quote the Apostles' Creed. Jesus would say, it wasn't so from the beginning. Our church don't believe in divine healing. Jesus would say, it wasn't so from the beginning. You go back to the beginning. Our church doesn't believe in the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Jesus would say, it wasn't so from the beginning. We've got to go back to the beginning. Go back to where it started from. Therefore, Jesus said, you take the commandments of God and make them of no effect by your tradition. Taking the church, the commandments, the teaching of the Bible, and explain it all away, the and therefore you make the commandments of God without any effect. You take the word of God and explain it all away into some sort of a creed, and then you cry out, where is the God of the Bible? You've explained him away. You've took it all away from the people. When you tell them that the days of miracles are so, there is no such a thing as the Holy Ghost. There is no such a thing as divine healing. There is no such a thing as visit of angels. There is no such a thing as miracles. When you do that, you explain all the supernatural away from the Bible. Take God right out of the church. When you do it, by tradition. Now, I think that for me, I want to worship and to worship with the church who believes the full gospel and preaches every word of it and practices every word of it. Those 
Back to the full gospel. Back to the power of God. Back to the Holy Ghost. Go back to the beginning. I receive it, but they did at the beginning. And it'll bring forth the same result it did at the beginning. If you'll just go back to the beginning to pick it up. Oh, today it reminds me many get so upset by trying to find great big places and beautiful pipe organs and those things are all right. If a church has got a million dollar gold cross on the top of it, it's got a million dollar gold organ, and in that church the Holy Spirit has a right away, praise God, how about you belong to that church? Right. But I don't care what it's got, if the Holy Ghost isn't there, there's no place for me. <laughs> I want to be where they preach it like it fell at the beginning. That's what I know. Like they got it at the beginning. That's the only thing I know about. It. The way they got it at the beginning. That's the reason tonight that I'm here in peace. The reason this crowd's got it out here is because we believe it like they got it at the beginning. God is infinite. He cannot change. Man changes. Time changes. Things changes. Wild changes. Churches changes. But Christ remains the same yesterday, today, and forever. And can never change. He's just like he was at the beginning. Oh, the, you say, well, our church has been in existence for years and years and years and years. That's good. That shows that it's held on. But brothers, if they don't, had the power of God preach the full gospel, it wasn't so from the beginning. I got one little girl sitting here looking at me, little Sarah, and I got another little girl at home, Rebecca. Rebecca's quite a good sized girl now. She's about 14 years old, her friend. Sarah's only about eight. And they're both daddy's little girls. And so when I go out on a meeting and start, come home, they usually set up to wait for me. And I got a little terrible, a little thing I want to tell you about. One night I was late coming in, and Mother and I had watched for a long time, and Sarah and Becca had had on their pajamas, and they were waiting, this is before Joseph was born, and they were waiting for me to come in, and it got late. The meeting never closed so late, and I had to drive a long ways, and so the mother put the little fellas to bed. And I never got in until around 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. I went in, laid down, went to sleep. Around about 5 or 6 o'clock, being tired and nervous from the meeting and the season and so forth. I got up. I went in the front room, sat down, and sat. In a few moments, Rebecca woke up. She looked around, it was daylight. She thought, well, Daddy's home now. And she looked over and seen her little sister, Sarah, sleep. Out of bed she went. Here she comes to the room. She woke up Sarah. Sarah realized it was daylight, so here she come behind Becky. I don't know about your children, but the oldest one gets the clothes and the next one gets the hand-me-downs. And so Sarah was wearing project Becky's pajamas. The feet was too long and they were too big for her and too many short fellas. Becky could run pretty well, so she beat Sarah, and Sarah had big feet flopping like that. Snow she rabbit, coming through there, falling over everything. Becky ran, got there first, and she jumped up on my lap, and drove both arms around me, and she hugged me, and oh, you know how it makes you feel. Oh, I wasn't half so tired after that. And after a while, little Sarah arrived on the scene as she got up every time, and she standing at the door, and she looked. And Becky turned around and looked at Sarah and said, Sarah, my sister, I want you to know something. And she said, I was here first. And I've got all of that. And there's none left for you. Well, and little Sarah, her little lips dropped down, her little brown eyes began to water, and she turned around. I looked at her, I hope that's the way God looks at me sometimes. And she was so disheartened because of Becky got there first and she stuck out across my leg and she had her arms around me and come on! 
Now, you can't claim every bit of God there's room for some more. No matter who was there first. And then it goes fast out of the doorway, and I looked at it like that, and she looked sideways at me, and her little brown eyes were I'm listening to it with my finger. I bet you had the head lean up against mine. I held out the other knee. And here she come and jumped up on my knee, and she was tied full gospel type. She wasn't quite long legged enough to brag about any way back to the beginning. And she was tied pottery like. And I had to put both arms around her to hold her. Because the freak had fell off my knee. But that knee was long legged and she was pretty well balanced. And she could hold herself. But Sarah couldn't hold herself. She was wobbling. And I put my arm around Sarah like that and hugged her real close to me. She said four or five times and then she looked back and she said, Rebecca, my sister, I want to tell you something, too. He said, it may be true that you've got all of daddy, but I want you to know one thing, daddy's got all of me. <laughs> That's the way it is with this gospel. Your passion gospel. I may mean, not have all of the theology, but one thing I know, I want Christ to have all of me. He said, you're me. No matter how misbehaving and how I jump and run and shout and slobber, that don't make anything to do with it. As long as he's got me in his full control, I don't care what happens. How great a lot more. All of me, Lord. Just keep me wrapped in your arms. That's what I, all I care for. They asked the day after they explained away everything if they all them days were gone. Well, our teachers way back under told us that them things ceased and with the apostles and so forth. Then you say, where is God? Where is that great God? Where is that people today in our churches that's selling out the communism and everything else like that? They didn't have it in the early church. They were selling the other way because they got something back there that made them ready to go to death for these things and these principles that Christ stood for because Christ was in the heart. Oh, that's what we need. That's in the beginning. It reminds me in the Bible. I told a story, I read it in there, where at the age of 12 years old, Jesus was taken to the Feast of Pentecost with his mother and his foster father. And they went up to Pentecost for the worship, and oh, they were so took up with their friends and everything. When their worship was over and they started back, they went three days journey without him just thinking he was somewhere amongst their kinfolk. I just wonder if we haven't gone a little journey. Just perceiving he's all right. Uh, what if this nation hasn't done like that? Oh, we're a religious nation. God is with us. And that's all that makes any difference. He's helped us in the war, so makes no difference. Just perceiving that uh, he was with their relations. Finally, they got uneasy about him. And they went back to their relation and did not find him. And that's the way it is today. We go back to our religious relations. What do we do? Go back to a certain big church. Well, what about the God that the power fell on the day of Pentecost? Oh, that was in a, another day. That wasn't this. Where is the divine healing? The churches has begun to shake back. Man of this day, Brother Duplicis, to tell you the same, the great leaders among great churches has beginning to look back. Check it out. And men of Lutheran, Presbyterian backgrounds are talking for the real thing that come over there Pentecost. Right. They're not finding in their denominations and things, but they're getting themselves together and saying, where did we leave him at? He's not among our relations. He's not among our acquaintance. Where did they leave him at? Where did, was Jesus at that? At the Feast of Pentecost. That's exactly where the church is left him. They left him at Pentecost. The only way to get the real message is go back to Pentecost. Where we left him at? Go back to where the Holy Ghost came, back to the Russian mighty wind and fell on the church. Their hearts were a fire and burnt with the power of God. They went forth healing the sick and casting out evil spirits and prophesying, speaking with tongues and showing signs and wonders. That's the only way, brother and sister, that we'll ever be able to find God back in the church is go back where we left him at at the beginning. As good as 
Martin Luther and many of the other great reformers in their days, as good as they have been, other great religious men. We cannot go back into them things and find it. We got to go back to the very beginning, back to Pentecost. That's where we left him. That's where the church left him. That's where great leaders of Lutheran and Presbyterian and so forth are reaching back to the denominations and can't find him. And they're going back to the full gospel. Hungered and thirsting for God. Hallelujah. All the Father has given me will come to me regardless if they're Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian, or Lutheran. God's got children in the Catholic Church. He's got children in the Jewish Orthodox Church. He's got children in the Baptist Church and the Presbyterian and the Lutheran. Right? And they begin to hunger because they missed him. Our tradition, our church priest will never satisfy a heart that's been called of God. You cannot make him say the Apostles' Creed or be sprinkled or something like that. that be satisfied with it. When the hunger of God's in his soul, he'll go back to Pentecost to the beginning and find the real Holy Ghost that takes his heart. Amen. That's what we need back to the beginning. Jesus said it wasn't so from the beginning. Jesus also said in that day, he said, I am the vine, ye are the branches. I am the vine. Now listen, friends, you are grapes. You great man here that raises grapes and whatever you raise, if a vine goes forth and the first branch that comes out of that vine bears grapes, the second branch will bear grapes, the third branch will bear grapes, and every branch that comes out of that vine will bear grapes. Right? Because it's a great vine. And if the first church that come out of that vine was a Pentecostal church that wrote a book of Acts behind it, the second church comes out to do the same thing in the third church. And every church that rises out of that vine will be a Pentecostal church with the same signs and wonders that the first vine produced, or the first branch produced. It'll be that Pentecost. Every church that rises out of that vine will be a Pentecostal church. Now that sounds strange, but you know there's a lot of things goes on along the vine. It doesn't produce vines, doesn't produce branches, rather. Now there's a, a Jewish Pentecostal branch come out of that tree or, or that vine on the day of Pentecost. And we're at the end of the road now. The Gentile branch that comes out of that tree will have a Pentecostal experience. Oh, God, I wish I could push that in the heart. I wish I had something or other that I could show the people that the first branch out of the vine bore Pentecostal evidence. The second branch will bear Pentecostal evidence. There you are. Back to the beginning. Back to where he started from. That's the reason today that through traditions and so forth we explained the way all the supernatural. That the Holy Ghost comes, fell upon the people. They begin speaking with tongues. The people made fun of them, called them holy rollers, and cast them out to one side. They kept growing, growing. What's it coming to now? Greater things than this. Divine healing services started. Then the angel of the Lord come in, manifesting the spirits of the gifts, revealing back again the very same spirit that was in the church at the beginning, that knew the secrets of the heart and could speak it out, which was the sign of the Messiah. The Bible said so. The Bible declares it. And if that was the sign of the Messiah at the beginning, it's the sign of the Messiah at the end. Oh, if you could see it, let him that has ears hear. He that has eyes see. If it was so at the beginning that Jesus Christ made himself known to the last age of the Jews and the Samaritans by a Messiah's sign, that same sign will take place at the end of the Gentiles. Because it's another branch out of the same vine. While the life in the vine produces grapes, the second branch will produce grapes. Now you can draft something in there. You can take a draft and put it in there. It'll never bear the life of the vine. Right. No, sir. The life of the vine is grapes. They'll bear grapes. Everyone it produces. Everyone it produces will bear grapes. Man can draft anything in there. That's what's the matter today. We've drafted too much man-made doctrine. we got wild boards and everything else in it. But when the body itself puts forth a break, it'll be a Pentecostal thing. Who the Holy Ghost doing the same signs and wonders that they did at the beginning? 
so. My church doesn't believe in that. It wasn't so at the beginning. My church don't believe in shouting. It wasn't so at the beginning. My church don't believe in speaking in tongues. It wasn't so at the beginning. My church don't believe in water and mercy. It wasn't so at the beginning. All these great doctrines and fundamentals that the Bible teaches, it was so at the beginning, and every branch that comes forth out of that vine, it'll be the same thing today. If the branch comes out of the vine, it's been brought out by the vine. You got some man-made branches. You see that around here today. They'll grass the tree. Put off something I want to grass those young headers. That ain't what that tree produced. It's just giving enough for us to hold on. But it isn't the original fruit from the tree. But when that tree puts forth a branch, it'll be like the first one it puts forth. And when the church puts forth another church, it'll be a Pentecostal church with the signs of the Acts and the Apostles doing the same thing with the same Jesus, working the same because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. A Pentecostal branch. Filled with the Holy Ghost. Signs and wonders of the resurrection. Great things taking place among them. They who know that God in the last days shall do exploits. Yes, we're at the end time. What's the matter with the world? I might close in saying this. What's wrong with the world? It reminds me of something that happened here a few months ago at, in the city of Louisville, Kentucky, just across the river from where I live. There was a lady who had a little baby. Oh, I guess the little fellow was about three or four years old. And she was taken in, into a 10 cent store. Walking along there, and she'd pick up something and say, Look at you, sweetheart, look at you. And the little baby would just stare. Then he'd pick up something else and say, Look at you, dear. And the little baby just stare. The people, she got nervous. The people began to watch her. The people that was in the store, watching her sing her, she'd go from counter to counter and pick up something and say, Look, honey, does mommy's little boy see this? He just sat and stare. And after a while, she picked up a little bell, she'd pick up a little trinket. And so forth, just like a little boy that age ought to be attracted by. And she'd shake him. Finally, she picked up a little bell and she shook it. And he just stared. Said, Don't you hear that, honey? Look at here at Mama's daughter. You see that? And the little boy just stared and she fell across the counter and said, Oh, no, 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 it isn't so. And some of the people ran around to find out what was the matter with the woman. And when they did, run around to see what was the matter with her. Come to find out that. The little boy had just been to the doctor, and something had happened to him, and he'd lost all interest of anything like a little boy should at that age. He just sat staring in space. Something mentally had happened to him, and he didn't pay any attention to things that was uh, brought to him, like a boy ought to look at it at that age. And she said the doctor said he's better, but he isn't. That's what's the matter a whole lot like the church today. God has tucked the church in his arms, and he's shook an old Robert, a Tommy Osborne, a Tommy Hicks, many other gifts and wonders as he shook before the eyes of the people, and they who claim to be religious, and they sat and stared, and after that they didn't even pay any attention to it. There's something mentally wrong with the church. Something is wrong. God just plays his gifts. They walk around and say, um, mental telepathy. Oh, they're just putting on their speaking in tongues. There's nothing to it. See people shouting and praising God, the tears running down their cheeks. Oh, she's just worked up. There's nothing to it. See, a church ought to be paying attention to that. A Christian, because it's written in the Word. They did that at the beginning. There's something wrong with the church. Something wrong with the people. Something wrong with the nation. We ought to go back to the beginning, go back to where we left Jesus, go back where the church left him at. The church left him at the Pentecostal feast, like the mother and them did, like Mary did, like Joseph did. They were good people, but they left Jesus at Pentecost. People today are fine people, religious people, but they're leaving Jesus at Pentecost. They're afraid of it. They won't take a hold of it. It's a shame to think of it, but just the same, God is here. The Pentecostal blessing is here. No matter how much they try to explain it away, God goes right on giving them the Holy Ghost who believes in it, showing his signs and wonders, so at the day of his judgment, he will not be responsible. But we'll be responsible for not taking heed to what he has showed us by his word and by his spirit. That is true. God is here now. There's no reason for sick people to be lingering any longer. 
There's no need for people to be uh, uh, sitting in wheelchairs, laying in cots and, and uh, mutes and so forth. God is here. God is here. The power of the Holy Ghost is here. The same Jesus that performed wonders at the beginning is here. Because he said, well, why are the people still laying sick? There's many laid sick in his days, too. He passed through by the pool of Bethesda. There in a great multitude, many, two or three thousand people, perhaps, laying around a lame, blind, halt, and withered. He went right through that audience. So he found a man laying on a pallet. And he knew that he had been in this condition for so many years. And he said, Sir, would you be made whole? He said, I have no one to put me in the water. He said, Take up your bed and go into your house. Jesus was questioning, no doubt, but why didn't he have the rest of them? He said, Very, very, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing in himself but what he sees the Father doing. There's many people sick the day that the woman pressed through the crowd and touched his garment. There might have been hundreds of sick people standing around there, but she touched him with a touch that brought God there on the scene for her. That was God at the beginning. That's God the day he cannot say. He's the same God. He heals by faith. That's the way he said it at the beginning. That's the mark he laid down. Not by your salvation, not by your goodness, not by your money, not by your affiliation to church, but by your faith. That's what it is. If you can believe it, he'll make himself known that he's here. He'll make himself known that he's alive. He'll make himself known that he's the God of Pentecost. He'll make himself known in his church that he's Jesus Christ the same yesterday and forever. But he'll never touch you until you touch him first. That's right. He'll show himself, but you've got to do it. Amen. Do you believe that? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, my words might be as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal, but one word from you, Lord, will change the whole scene. Let it be known tonight, Lord, that these broken up words are truth. I pray that you'll bring them together in some way and sink them into the hearts of the people and let them know that you're still Jesus tonight, the great Son of God who walked through Galilee and never made no respect a person, but whosoever had faith to touch you, whosoever had faith was healed. Multitudes you passed by and you never received healing because they did not believe it. But those, when you went into your own country, many mighty works you could not do because of their unbelief. So is it tonight. That's the way it was at the beginning. That's the way it is tonight. But you walked through the people and showed the people that you were the Messiah when you told Peter who he was, what his name was. He didn't do you right quick that you were the Son of God. When you told Philip, Nathaniel, down through the Bible, the Samaritan woman and many others were told in the Bible that the Word of God, which is Jesus, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. The Word, Jesus, is sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even to the thunder and the mire of the bone, and a discerner of the thoughts of the heart. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Oh, God of heaven, seeing the evening shadows falling, the time coming close at hand. And you're so gracious, Lord. Let people see tonight that you are gracious. You're full of love and full of mercy and full of compassion. And now let these people who are blessed by receiving your Holy Spirit, these who are blessed to feel the call of God in their life, I pray, Father, that you'll give them faith to press in now and touch the garment of him, the high priest that sits at the right hand of God in the heavens, ready to be touched, holding out his, not only his garment, but his hand, to take every thinking person tonight as without hope, and give them mercy and heal their bodies. Grant it, Father, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. My watch didn't go off. I had it set for 20 minutes, but I run a little bit about 25 minutes. But I didn't mean to keep you so long, but do you believe that message is the truth? Do you believe it? Back to the beginning. Back to the beginning. If somebody says, I don't believe in the divine healing, you say, once it's so from the beginning. I don't believe in the baptism of the Holy Ghost. It was his soul from the beginning. I don't believe in divine healing. It was his soul from the beginning. For in the beginning they believed in 
and the baptism of the Holy Ghost. They believed in speaking in tongues. They believed in all the spiritual gifts. Paul wrote them in the book of Corinthians and set the church in order. That's the way it was at the beginning. That was the will of God at the beginning. He's the infinite God who cannot change. If that was his will at the beginning, that's his will tonight. Anything contrary to that is he. And there are man perverting the commandments of God. Then we wonder, where is that spiritual church today? Where is that church that rocked the world at the beginning? What's the matter? I heard an order of the just not long ago. Thing. I went into a city and held a revival. In there we claimed 30,000 converts in six weeks. He said, I went back in another year. We couldn't find 30 of the 30,000. He said, what's the matter, two lazy preachers? Set with your feet up on the desk and don't go out and see the people. Oh, how he did burn them up. I thought, sir, that's true, a lot of it. But I want to ask you something. You said Paul went into a city and had one convert, went back the next year, and he had 30 from that one. What did Paul do? He led them to the fountain. Not just by shaking hands and putting your name on the book. Not by making some kind of confession and promising you'll do better, but stay there until you are dead and your life is hidden God through Christ and sealed by the Holy Ghost. The fire of God is burning that heart of you, but... When you, uh, if a person will accept Christ on those bases and I come back here a year from now, I'll have great, 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 great grandchildren off of that. Right. Great! I want to get another, 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 step like that. But what you've got to do first is come close enough. The world's trying to live tonight on a painted bar. They're trying to live, trying to get warm by a painted bar. You can't do that. You paint a picture of fire and say, oh, sir, go down and get warm. That paint won't warm you. You've got to have a living fire today. Not go back and say they had a great church one day and a great church back there. We will need a great church today because you still a great God looking for a great people. That will carry you with all your heart. That will forget their creeds and so forth and serve God. If you're a Methodist, stay a Methodist. Forget the Holy Ghost. As Brother David DePritzer says, God don't have any grandchildren. He doesn't. God has all together sons and daughters. No grandchildren is right. Yes, sir, if you're a Methodist and a son of God, amen. If you're a Methodist, the church joining your grandfather and not recognizes God. If you're a Pentecostal church joining because your daddy was Pentecost, you're a Pentecost, you're a grandfather and not a son. But if you're born to the Spirit of God, God don't have grandchildren, you're right, Brother DePlissus. You don't have any grandchildren. You're sons and daughters of God or you're not even in the family. God doesn't recognize them. Not because your father was something, it's what are you? Every man's got to be born again. And this sinful nature is killed in him. And a new man born in him, which is Christ Jesus, the Son of God. Then you surrender yourself completely to Christ. And Christ comes in and writes the book of Acts. I ah, know that's the truth, my friend. Ah, I know it's the truth. God said if you can only yield yourself. What did that woman do that he touched his garment? She knew how to yield herself. She touched him by yielding herself. Why about the visions on the platform out through there and over the country, wherever it is, it's yielding yourself to the Holy Spirit. Get yourself out of the way, your own ideas, and just be led by the Spirit. That's why. I love him. I love him. Christians would raise your hands with and sing that with me now. Ah, 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 ah,
person on this top. Have you got a prayer card? You don't? Do you believe what you've heard tonight to be the truth? Do you have ever heard of these meetings before? Do you believe that you and your condition could touch the hem of his garment behind him? And he would know, just like he did the woman at the well, what your conditions are, and would tell you, me being a stranger to you, and would tell you your conditions, you think you could enjoy the meeting and be well? He did. I don't know you. I've never seen you. You're stranger to me, but you're not to him. I hear your conditions. Look at me. That's it. You believe me to be his prophet, his servant. You do. You accept that, believe it. See what I mean? He told me when you get the people to believe you. That's Peter and John said, look on us. I have no idea what's wrong with you, but he does. But if you can reveal to me, see you turn around there and put your hands down like that, start crying, praying. I'm just a conversation with you. Now, we do not know each other. You're way younger than I am. First time ever meeting, but here we are. There's some connection with this person here with you. The mother. Is that right? True. What do you think about it, lady? How do I know that that is your daughter? She is the mother. God will be good. Thank you, sister. Then you stop worrying about that cancer in your stomach. You want the Holy Spirit to And you, young lady. Yours is some sort of knowledge that gives you weak before you can't walk the time. Forget it. Get up off your cot and go get your feet somewhere and go on the Wait just a minute, sisters. Just a minute, young lady. Somebody out there that's sick, raise up your hand. If I can get somebody that's sick, needs healing of the Lord. I need two seats, just a moment. Lord, you give them, please. The, the people might know that you're God. These messages are true. Hemorrhoids, do you believe God will make you well? Say amen. Yeah? You believe that I'm a stranger, you am a young man? Yes, sir. I'm a stranger, you got hemorrhoids. By the way, the man sitting next to you has also got hemorrhoids. That's right. On this side. All right? You got hemorrhoids. How's your father getting along? Begin to see now, hasn't he? He was here at the platform last night. He's a preacher. I've never seen you in my life, but that's right, wave your hand. Now you just get away with your hemorrhoids, you're that man, you have to give these women your seat. Go back there and stand up so God has made you well. So they take your seat. Amen. Ah! Ask 
say. This elderly lady sitting out there crying, she goes up right over. That bounce of the mission goes away, sister. You may go on to him as well. He's a cross makes you well. The message I have preached tonight that he's the same for that to the beginning. You can touch his God and he's a high priest just the same tonight as he was then. That can be touched by the he did out there. He said he did out some more. Let's get a few of them up here in the house so that people got a fair part. We don't need but a few of them. Let's start starting these great parts. Just along a little line through here, like this. Let's see. What was this? We went one to fifty last night. Let's just take the last. That's right. He said he would be here. Yes. Wherever two or three are gathered in my name, yes. I'll be in their midst. Now, is he the same yesterday day, and forever? Do you believe him to be the same? The same in principle? Same in power? The only thing different tonight that he's using your flesh and my flesh. Because his flesh sits at the right hand of the throne of God in majesty and glory. And he that overcometh shall sit with me on my throne as I have overcome and set down on my Father's throne. Oh, what a wonderful thing. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, stepping in the heavens, and all those mortal souls that's just under the altar look up and see that body sitting there, that powerful body. Oh, I feel religious. That powerful body. You notice down in Egypt, they gave a powerful body. Joseph, which was a type of Jesus in every manner, that powerful body lay there, and every Israelite beaten it in his back and, and strength from the Egyptians, went down there and looked into that casket and saw that tomb. There lay Joseph's body and know that someday they would go out of there. They were going out, and that body raised from that tomb, and they packed it out, they were going out with it. That's the same way it is in heaven. Those souls on the altar crying, how long, Lord? How long? They're like the often is there. But now, they're looking to that corporal body of the Son of God saying, that someday, he'll rise from that throne. Oh, my God. Them that are in Christ will God bring with him at the resurrection. They'll take this mortal, take on immortality. And then we will be like him. We will see him as he is. He can let him suffer with him and all forever be with the Lord. Isn't that wonderful? Send his Holy Spirit down here to come into our flesh, which he has sanctified with his own blood. You believe in sanctification? Be you holy for I'm holy. Now you cannot be holy. I'm not depending on my holiness. I have none. But I'm depending on his holiness. It's his holiness that I'm looking at. Not what, well, not what I was, but what he is. That's it. Go back to the beginning. There it is. Jesus Christ the same yesterday. Give him all around. All right. Now, the Lord bless Oh, my, that just sounds so good. Are you ready? Let's just stop for a minute with some of these people. Are we saying this one another, lady? Yeah. I, I just feel so full of the Holy Spirit and I just feel like burning over. Just, just, oh, I wish it would stay this way. Let it never leave. You're believing. This is an act that anything can happen. Now, if I couldn't heal you and wouldn't do it, I'd be an awful person. But I cannot heal you. But if, if Jesus Christ, the Son of God, which has healed you, if you're sick, I don't know. But if he has healed you, and will come here and prove that he's standing here working through my flesh, through your flesh, for you to believe that he sent this message and he's here to confirm this message and will do something here like he did the woman at the well, would it make you believe him? Would there be not a shadow of doubt then? If he knows what you have been, 
he surely know what you will be. Now, this woman and I never seen each other, I suppose, in life. This is the first time I ever seen her. And she says that we are strangers, one to another. I say the same. That's right, isn't it? We're strangers. All right? Now, if Jesus Christ remains the same yesterday, today, and forever, then he'll act the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, go back to the beginning. What was the beginning? I made the people know that he was Jesus Christ, the Messiah. He sold the secrets of their heart. By that, they believed. Is that right? The woman at the well said, Come, we know that when the Messiah cometh, he'll tell us these things. Not a Messiah. Said, But who are you? Are you a prophet? He said, I'm he. She ran to see, said, Come see a man who told me about myself. Isn't this the very Messiah? And they believed. They had a revival after that when Philip went on there, because they were believers. If the Lord will tell me what's your trouble, then you'll believe it. To be his servant. Uh, just a gift that he asked for. Uh, I couldn't do it unless you believe me. That's the reason I'm questioning. But it will help you. It will help the audience. Will it, audience? Now, look at you. Here's the Bible. Here's a woman. Here's my hand. As far as I know, I've never seen her. I don't know her. She does the same. We don't, she don't know me. I don't know her no more just me. She knows, I don't know her name, of course not, but uh, I just know she's a woman standing there. She might know that I'm Brother Brown by being here in the meeting. I'll read whatever. Now, is Jesus the same from the beginning now? Now, the Bible says he is. Is that right? Now, is he? Is the next thing. Now, if he is, he'll do the same. Your troubles in your kidney. No wonder you didn't know me. You're from way away from here. You're not from Arizona even. You're not from the United States. You're from Canada. Mrs. Clark, you can go back to Canada and be made well. Jesus Christ. Another thing. I've seen somebody else appear in the same country you're from. A sick friend in Canada you're praying for. You'll find him well if you'll believe. <laughs> Is Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever? Praise his holy name. We are strangers to one another. God knows both of us. I do not know you, and perhaps you don't know me no more than by name. But Christ does know you. Do you believe he is able to reveal to me what your trouble is? Would it help you to believe? They won't hear you, but it will help you to believe. All right. Now, if you know I don't know nothing about you, then God reveals that it has to come from some spiritual resource right here on this platform. Think of it, church. Surely you won't turn the alarm off. No. I trust the little buzzer. We're just buzzing your heart the Holy Spirit now and say, Be not afraid of God. Amen. Huh? You've had an operation. A garter. It wasn't too successful. The garter operation was all right, but it had a bad after effect. That's right. And the operation caused you to have some kind of uh, after effect that settled to your stomach. You got stomach trouble. And you got something wrong with your arm. That is right. That's true. Okay. But you might know that I'll be his prophet, his servant. No more to be his prophet than his preacher or his teacher. I'm not ashamed of him. You believe your husband's going to get well too? <laughs> You believe God can tell me what's in trouble out there? He's got a knowledge of you. That's right. Go and take that little thing you got in your hand and put it in his pocket. And now if you won't bother him no more, if you'll just believe him. Return and be made well. Or Jesus Christ makes you well. Well, what if I told you that the heart trouble left you sitting there if you just believe it? Do you believe it? Or just go on around? We are strangers to each other. Uh, I don't know you. God does know you. Do you believe God could reveal to me what your trouble is? Would it make you believe? Um, you see, it's making me weak, but I just want to talk to you now. Something, what, in the church, somebody was healed around. A great healing taking place somewhere. You might not know it right now, but you'll find it out. You felt it. 
You saw a light, well, that's right here when it left and come back. She saw the light when it left and come back. It's like she's standing right to Jesus right now. And, and you see that? All right, here you are. You are, you are suffering. You've had a, yes, you've had an operation too. And it caused something wrong in the tissue. It's in between the, about the kidney and the bladder. And the doctor goes to operate again. That's right. You believe you're going to be all right? You believe God knows who you are? Miss Gray, you can go home and be well. Jesus Christ knows who you are. Have faith in God. We are strangers, he said us there. I suppose our first time ever meeting. But God knows both of us. You believe he's the same God that when Simon Peter came up before him, he knew him, told him all about you. Believe it's the same Jesus. Now you're suffering with an ulcer. That's right. Hallelujah. Besides that, you got someone you're praying for. It's a child, a daughter. Hey, Amen. You got some kind of knock. On the Hallelujah, glory. You're not from here either. Hallelujah. It's something strange about you. I see my friend, Mr. Norman. From you're from Tucson. That's right. This guy's connected with a friend of mine, where's here, Mr. Norman, somewhere in the building, somewhere. You believe Jesus Christ? Suppose I told you he healed you right there. Would you take my word for it? Go on your road and be made well. Jesus Christ healed you. Tommy, go eat. Jesus healed you well. All faith. Your back shelf, and I think you'll leave you now. You'll go home, be well. It's for all me, Joyce. Thank you, Jesus. You love him with all your heart? If you love him, what if I told you that he'll come upstairs? Would you believe it? So you go on your own, rejoice. I'm saying thank you. Study too much. That's what made that hectic ulcer condition in your stomach. I go eat your supper. Jesus Christ. Oh. All right. You're nervous? Cause you have fluttering in your heart. Go be well now. Go believe the Lord Jesus. Well, now, if you believe with all your heart, that back trouble will leave you won't get up like that the next time. You'll be all right. Go believe with all your heart. Have faith. Nervous, lady trouble, and heart trouble. You believe that God's going to make you well? Go on your own. Say thank you. Right. You believe that? If I have that told you were healed standing there, would you believe it? Go believe it. Be well. You believe with all your heart? What about you, lady? If I told you that you're going to get well, would you believe it? If I told you, you want me to tell you what's wrong with you? Would it, would it help you if I told you what was wrong with you? All right. You got hay fever. You got a tumor. Both the operated on for it. You're not from this country. You're from this. You're from this state, but you're from Flagstaff. You got a boy up there. He's unsaved and he's sick. That's right. Your name is Mrs. Earl. Go back home and be well. In the name of Jesus Christ. Do you believe with all your heart? Hands on them and let's pray together. And believe that God's going to pour out the baptism of the Holy Ghost 